Welcome to the Biltmore Church Podcast. Our church exists to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus who reach up, reach in, and reach out. And this podcast is a resource that hopefully is going to help you do just that. We are back. We haven't recorded an episode in a couple of months. I'm so excited to be back. We made it to 2023, New Year. And this week, uh, we kicked off a new teaching series called The Tale of Two Kingdoms. And we're going to be talking about living as citizens of the kingdom of God while being uh, alive on this earth. I, I just totally botched the actual byline, but it, that's close enough to what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. My name is Christian Cooper. I serve on staff here, and I'm here today with our lead pastor, Bruce Frank. And I'm here with Tyler Frank, who serves as our Hendersonville campus pastor. And the big question I'm wondering is, are you guys related? <laughs> This is cool. Yeah. A little father-son action today. It's going to be fun. I'm also here, third wheel, (laughs) hanging out. So I'm really excited to talk um, a little bit this morning about the kingdom of God and having a great conversation. But before we do that, I would love to jump into some Sunday recap and talk about some of the things that we feel like God did through our church yesterday or Sunday with our Sunday services. Tyler, anything um, just jump into mind? Man, for me, I, I mean, it, it was really cool from my vantage point being at the Hendersonville campus. Um, for me, it was cool because we, you know, debuted the, the new song, Fully Convinced. And so in that moment, just from the service overall, uh, it, I believe it was on the bridge, right, um, when it says, Empty Tomb, Risen King. And so people were singing their faith about God's kingdom and singing about the Risen King, the message that the early church, we're carrying that early church message, right? Empty Tomb, Risen King fully convinced. Yeah. And so even before the sermon, which was awesome, even before other moments of response, even just for our people, at least at our campus, we sang great. Um, fully convinced, man, risen king, already singing about the kingdom. Yeah. Even in that moment from the third song. It was, it was great. Yeah, great way to start it. Yeah. Obviously, that's intentional. We've talked about yeah. that on oh, this yeah. podcast before. Um, I think for me, the, the so many things from the message, but thing that stood out and then came up again in our connect group on Sunday night was that idea is as members of the kingdom, um, we are to love, I'm, I got to make sure I say it the right way. We're to love the people and reject, reject the values of the world. Oftentimes we get that flipped, right? And we end up uh, hating the people and loving the values or rejecting the people and loving the values of the world. And so I think that idea, if correct me if I'm wrong, but that's something that's going to carry out through the next four, five, six, however many along the series goes, but that's something we're going to be talking about for several weeks, I would imagine. Yeah, especially when it comes to some of the dicier subject matters that are easy to uh, objectify or to put caricatures on certain, you know, types of folks. Um, sometimes it will, like when you talk about your job, not as much so, but when it comes to, you know, other things, it will, for sure. The hot button issues, right? Several of the hot button issues, yeah. Yeah, we're Sweating going to talk already. about those. <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, great day, great Sunday uh, as we kicked off that new series. If you're listening, if you're watching, let me encourage you, take the time. Uh, if you weren't here on Sunday, or maybe even if you were here on Sunday at one of our campuses to go back, uh, listen to the message, watch that service. Uh, it will be good for your soul as we take this journey together as a church. And today, we're just going to continue that conversation about the kingdom of God and just see where it goes. All right, today for our main discussion, we're going to be talking about the kingdom of God, something we talked quite a bit about on Sunday. I want to continue that conversation here today. So uh, I'd love to frame our conversation this way, maybe three different things, and some of these ideas are coming out of your message, is what is the kingdom of God? Uh, Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about the kingdom of God in Scripture. So if this is such a huge theme throughout the Bible, where do we see it? How does it present itself? And then lastly, uh, kind of prime the pump for what is our role in the kingdom of God today uh, as followers of Jesus. So first off, very loaded question. Whoever wants to jump in first here, feel free. Uh, what is the kingdom of God? How do we define the kingdom of God? All right, let me jump in first. And this actually, normally a question like that is answered very very simply. Uh, this one is not one of those times. Mm. Uh, on its surface, it is. I mean, the kingdom has a king. Uh, that king is Jesus. And there's a sense in which it is about the sovereign rule of God over all things. And so in some ways, it's kingdom is just the, the word, you know, basilia, I think, is just the idea of it's his kingdom. Um, you know, the Bible talks about, listen, the, the whole earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Mm-hmm. So there's a sense in which it's the sovereign rule of God over all things. There is a sense in which that is. But 
the part that was kind of the hardest to grasp for me, because this is, I haven't done a series like this, uh, and the part, honestly, that can be abused at times if you want to make it say what you, you know, what yeah. you want it to say. And there's a lot of, you know, uh, as image bearers, how do we image him? which kind of goes to our role. Uh, some people go back to, it's like, all right, our role is to subdue and cultivate. You know, you go back to the Genesis account and then, well, how do you do that? I know that's a question in a minute, but I think the part that is the most, uh, was most, was good for me was to go back historically and see how the kingdom and what the Jewish people, especially in the new Testament, when Jesus came on the scene, uh, in his ministry, what were they expecting, which shows a lot of their reactions and then how Jesus said the kingdom is so much bigger than what you all had previously thought. Mm. And it was unexpected in the sense uh, of they did not foresee this age we're in right now, the, this, this time between the first and second coming. They right. really didn't see it. They kind of jumped this part. And then as Jesus began to talk about, okay, the kingdom of God is here. First John the Baptist talked about it. The kingdom of God, basically, the kingdom of God is him but then also how that was going to expand. And that's why they got so troubled when he started talking. They loved it at the first when he's like, I'm here. And then he started showing the kingdom with the healings right. and the miracles. But then as he started to kind of segue into number one, saying this is not just for you, the Jewish people, this is for outcasts, this is for sinful people. And then even more so that was even more unexpected for them was uh, not everything was going to be, not every wrong was going to be righted. And that really began to cause a lot of heartburn. And you see a lot of places where they'd kind of like, eh, this kind of thinned the herd out a little bit. Uh, but And then when you start talking about divine humility instead of militaristic takeover, right. that was a big shock, which again, for help for me, it was, it was and I, I'd read all this stuff before, but the idea of it helped me get in the shoes of the disciples that the cross was so devastating to them. Mm. Because that, again, no matter how much he discipled them, because that's what he was doing. He's discipling the disciples, and that's why all his so many of his parables are like, the kingdom of God is like this, the kingdom of heaven is like this, because he's having to get them out of that mindset. And then when the empty tomb happened, it's like, oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So anyway, that's that's uh, kingdom of God is now, but it's also not yet. Consummation has not taken place. Yeah. No, I think Dallas Willard, right? Kingdoms are the range of an effective will, right? And so that's just in historical terms. It's not even a Bible word, right? So kingdoms are just the range of someone's effective will. And so then whenever you have other people in different kingdoms clash, you have wills clashing. And so in the series, the kingdom of God is the range of God's effective will, which is all over the earth. And you start to see that in scripture. Yeah, his rule and reign. And it's, for me at least, the thing that, it's a, it's a contextual thing to kind of get through is that we don't live in in a, in a uh, like a, a society in which we have kings and queens, right? Here in America, that's not a thing that, ha that, that that we're underneath. And so we have to even push through that a little bit more to understand what it means for someone to be ruling and reigning. And, and the way God rules and reigns is so different than the way the world does. And that's something that obviously we're going to be exploring so much. Um, but just starting to, to, to see that in Scripture, I think, is so important. Uh, it's It's been helpful for me even just over the last couple of weeks preparing to have conversations like these or uh, create resources for our people that that theme is everywhere. It's not easy to define, right. but it's all over the place. Right, and if you really want to, and the, the macro picture of it, you go way back to the first books of the Bible, and you go back to some of those mysterious passages in Ezekiel about the fall of Satan and how he, you know, and so it is set apart against the what they call the, the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of the air or this present darkness. And it's not that those are two equal kingdoms. They're not. Right. They're not two equal kingdoms. It's not like, well, we're still battling. The victory's already been done. So mm -hmm. part of that is we we engaged by, you know, from the victory, not for the victory. The victory's already been done. But the kingdom of heaven is set against, particularly in the New Testament, against all of that background in Isaiah and Ezekiel about, you know, the rebellion, basically. It, almost, it sounds like, it's this, um, you know, it is this just amazing meta-narrative, but the sub substantial amount of information in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and how it's so far, so much in the New Testament, to me, it was somewhat, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time and, and studied it a long time, but it was so eye-opening for yeah. it was a lens when you see the how much of it is introduced from how you're supposed to pray to what are you supposed to seek to to it was an eye opener for me so i'm i'm i was this took the most time to get ready for sure cuz you're how do you, how do you take all that information you could do four parts on just the introduction so I apologize for being long yesterday as well to all my uh, campus pastors who had to get people in and out <laughs> from the first second to the second service and uh, to our to our uh, 
to our folks in the parking lot. I apologize. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. I, for, I saw it was 49 minutes, which hey, hey, covering hey. the kingdom there, that's thank not you. bad at all. Okay. I was saying you. it as a compliment. You know, it's not too bad at all. Appreciate it. <laughs> not the longest one I've ever done. <laughs> that's true as well. Oh, man, that's great. So uh, what you just said really starts to lean into the next two things we want to talk about, which is um, I, I want to almost create a straw man argument here, which is someone says, oh, kingdom of, kingdom of God, you're saying that's a huge theme in Scripture. Prove it. What, where is that? Um, and I think there are plenty of examples, but let's just run through some examples. Tyler, if you want to jump in here of yeah. where we see, obviously the, we you talked about how often the actual phrase kingdom of God or the word kingdom is in Scripture, but let's talk about just the theme itself. Where does that start? Where do we see it throughout the Bible? Yeah, uh, great question. Believe it or not, it, it's actually from the very beginning account of Scripture. You, you know, thrones and throne rooms are where kings rest, right? Right, And that's what we assume, right? And they inaugurate certain areas. There's the king's garden, there's the king's temple, there's the whatever. And, and in that language, a lot of scholars agree that um, from the very beginning, the seventh day, when God rested, not because he was tired, right? But a, a king is resting. Mm -hmm. And the whole earth of what he's created, the whole universe, he's resting. That's what a king does. And so even just from the very beginning, we see that. The next time you see it is in Exodus chapter 15. If you wanted to look at that, that's the account of God's people are rescued from Pharaoh, right? Mm -hmm. You talk about a king, there was a bad king. Mm -hmm. And this Pharaoh making them slaves. And so the good king has had enough and he's heard the cry of his people. And then you see the song of Moses, which is the poetic account of, okay, what's happening, right? And the language that they use is a king is now dead and the true king uh, reigns, quote, forever and ever. Mm. And so it's beautiful. That's kind of the story of the Old Testament that they use. They use um, not only the Passover, they use the Exodus story mm -hmm. as their kind of master story of, okay, there is a king, he's heard his people, and now his effective will is now put into action and his kingdom comes with good things, right, for his people. And a lot of people also use the Exodus account when Paul, we quoted on, uh, on Sunday, um, rescued, transferred from a domain of darkness yep. mm -hmm. to the kingdom of the beloved son. A lot of people are saying, hey, Paul, Paul's riffing on uh, his, his understanding of what happened at the Exodus is this king is now dead and now the true king is now assumed with his people. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's just even the first two books. Right? Yeah. Genesis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking Genesis 1, you yeah. see it, the creation account. Yeah. You know, he, God creates Adam and Eve and he's basically saying, I want you to rule and to reign yeah. with me, which mm -hmm. is a kind of a wild thing that from the beginning God's inviting people to Basically, I don't know if co-rule, I mean, that seems like a strong word, but that's really what he's offering up now. He's the one ultimately in authority, right. but he's extending that authority to us, which is rather mind-blowing. The more you think about it, the more your brain gets tied up in knots. Um, but yeah, where else? Where else do we see that theme? Uh, the easiest thing, if one of the listeners wants to, uh, take your little, uh, take whatever Bible app you have, type in the word kingdom, and you will have a plethora of yeah. things to look at. Um, I enjoyed most looking at Matthew's account because of his audience and, you know, especially talking to the Jews and all their, all their preconceived notions. And so if you do, I think it's 30 plus times just in Matthew wow. um, from the parables from John, you know, from the third chapter uh, where John the Baptist steps out, that's the content of Jesus's preaching. Right. Um, it's what they're talking about in the book of Acts, even still, it's like, Hey, when's the kingdom coming? They still don't know, yeah. or they're still not, not, yeah bought into it. And again, that whole sense, I remember the phrase, I think it was John Tyson I heard use the phrase divine humility mm. as, about the cross. And I was like, that stuck with me. I'm like, divine humility, which was the opposite, again, of, of you go back to the leaders like what Tyler was talking about, those leaders, whether it be Moses or David or even Solomon, yeah. or even all the good kings, there were not that many good kings mm -hmm. in Israel, but there were a few good kings, tons of bad kings. But when you had a good king, things typically went well for God's people. When you had a bad king, it typically went bad. So again, in their mind, it was so jarring for them. He wasn't going to change everything. And it just, again, it goes yeah. back to the cross, the empty tomb, the whole gospel story starting in Genesis 3. And, and even going back to Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 3, if there was ever a doubt in Old Testament language, if there was ever a doubt about who the real king was, it's like, hey, who's the real king? Who has the right to be on the throne if it's David or whatever? You see David anointed, contrary to all of his brothers, mm -hmm. right, compared to that. And Using that kind of language, Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus is baptized, right? Okay, 
if there ever was a doubt, if there is a true king, who, who's, who is this Messiah figure, which is a kingly word? Messiah is a, yep. an anointed, authoritative person. Right. Uh, if there was ever a doubt, this is my beloved son, and he just speaks that over. So that's, that is, in many ways, the anointing of the Messiah, mm-hmm. when you, just right from the beginning, mm-hmm. you see it in Matthew chapter 3, which is, again, like a David anointing, like we see in Scripture in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and even, I think you mentioned this on Sunday, but the, really the first thing that Jesus says in multiple gospel accounts yeah. when he starts teaching is, hey, the kingdom of God is at hand. Yeah, actually, yeah, repent for yeah. the kingdom yes. of God is yes. here. It, it, yeah, it, so it's right off the bat, that was his message, and, repent for the kingdom of God is here. And, and like we mentioned, Jesus didn't invent the word or phrase kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like, I mean, that's in the Psalms. They would read that mm-hmm. every Sabbath and they would read mm-hmm. Psalm 145, mm-hmm. right? The Lord's, the whole earth is the Lord's kingdom. So it, he didn't invent that word, but he did redefine it when you get to the New Testament. Sure. He, he did mm. uh, in many ways encapsulate some of the verbiage that we see. It's not birth or biology or lineage. It's by faith. Yeah. It's entrance into the kingdom. Yeah. So he did def- redefine it. Yeah. So let me clarify just before we move on to, to what we do today. I think an important part of this is if kingdom uh, imagery is all throughout cover to cover in the Bible, uh, let's clarify that we as humans have not done a great job of understanding and living appropriately in the kingdom of God. Am I, is that a correct statement to make? We've kind of made a mess of it several well, times over. No, well, yeah, we make a mess of it. And, you know, the Bible's like a great encouraging story for two chapters, you know, Genesis <laughs> 1 and 2. Yeah. And, it, you know, it all goes downhill in, in, from then. And that actually, you can, in some ways, you can say it goes downhill and then Jesus comes, again, his public ministry, that's his first thing, repent for the kingdom of God. In a sense, the kingdom of God is me. I'm the kingdom of God is what he's saying. I am here. And then he begins to expand their understanding of what it was. I mean, it's not like he redefined what God meant. He's redefining what they thought it was going to be. So that's why I say at the start, they did not understand this. They didn't tend to understand what we're in right now, the church age, whatever you want to call it. They didn't understand that time of this, this phase of the kingdom, if you will. Yeah, that's great. I um, was thinking about just... You go back to that, like you said, two chapters. So Genesis 3 on, we have essentially, we've made a mess of over and over again, trying to create our own kingdom, trying to puff ourselves up, you know, build a tower to the heavens. You you go through narrative and narrative and narrative, and you see that theme over and over again. And the funny example for me, (laughs) I was thinking about on Sunday, just thinking about what what have we done with God's essential authority that he's given us is there's a a great episode of The Office. Uh, Hopefully you remember this one where where they make uh, Dwight the acting manager for a short time while oh, they're yeah. waiting. And oh, yeah. literally within hours, he has completely ruined everything. I mean, it's over the top. He's walking around with a gun around his waist, pretending like he's hot stuff. He's got this gigantic like dictator desk set up in his <laughs> office. It, it goes so badly so quickly. Uh, and I say that kind of fun example because what it, it shows me is that the incredible grace of God toward me is that we have done that a hundred times over, you know, not, we personally have done that, but also throughout scripture, humanity has done that. And yet he still continues to establish his kingdom. That offer of co-ruling is still on the table. That's which good. Is beautiful. And I might actually steal that office uh, illustration go. from you Sunday. <laughs> and I said, it's here first. It's a wise person once said, uh, <laughs> the it. great theologian Dwight Schrute. <laughs> that's right. That's uh, right. Once said, oh, that's good. Uh, it is good. I mean, even in, even in the tradition of the new Testament, and I'm sure we'll get to like, the early church was so radical because they they viewed the, the kingdom of God. There was a little bit of like, oh my goodness, what's happening? But even in Acts 17, they're persecuted because they said there's another king mm. that's not Caesar, right? And that's what we talked about. And that's what it says, verse seven, uh, seven, Acts 17, 7. The decrees of Caesar, they're going against them saying there is another king, Jesus, period. Mm-hmm. There's so much there. I mean, yeah. again, you could, I'd encourage people like to do exactly what you said, go in there, type that word in there, track it, read the chapters that it's in. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, it would take you quite a while. It is all over the place. Yeah. And I was, I mean, even you think of some of the famous passages that many people even have memorized that from a kingdom lens takes on a different uh, understanding, like seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Well, if you don't know what the kingdom is or even some clues on it, what does that even look like um, if we're supposed to seek that first? And so I think it was, I think it was J.D. Greer. I, th- I like the way he phrased it. He said that the fundamental question for the Christ follower is whose kingdom are you building? Mm. That's the fundamental question, but it's based, it's just a rephrasing of uh, what Matthew six thirty three, 
It's yeah. like, all right, whose kingdom am I building? And so when we look at things in the coming weeks, like, you know, your vocation, vocation actually means calling. Mm. You know, we think of it as just a job. And we're, what we'll try to do is realize that we want to take down the secular sacred divide, which is very preeminent. Mm. This is my church life. Well, listen, if you're a, if you're an image bearer, you image him and your work and in your marriage and in, you know, uh, your maleness or your, whatever it is, you, you, you image him. Um, and so that's what we'll kind of take it from the baseline from yesterday. Such a fantastic segue there into what we're going to talk about next. I it, just thinking about our conversation so far, if you're listening, you're watching, you may be thinking that a lot of what we've said is very like theoretical or, uh, theological, if you want to use another big word, we're talking about ideas a lot. And so all those things are intentional because those things, like what I'm hearing you say, those inform what we do now and how we live in the kingdom now. And we're, we're going to spend a lot of time on that. But uh, let's talk for a few minutes about what our role is in the kingdom today. So right now, January, whatever today is, I don't know what, what the date is, 2023, um, as a follower of Jesus, what is our role in the kingdom of God? That's another loaded question. I'll set up the I'll, I can set up the tension because this is really it maybe generational, maybe whatever. But I think there's a tension there. Um, I think it was Mark Sayers we talked about. Mark Sayers said a lot of people in culture, depending on which you know we talked about a little bit on Sunday, they want the the king without the kingdom. Mm-hmm. They want or or the, the other opposite. Way around. They want yeah. the kingdom stuff, but they don't want what the king has to say about it. And that's the balance. And I think that's the tension that as Christ followers, okay, there's a king, authority, ruler, what he says goes, but then also the kingdom stuff. And then that that creates the tension that, or again, why we're addressing it in the series. Wanting both is the key. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so one of the things I heard, uh, I have heard, I think from our friend Joby Martin, is uh, when it comes to kind of living as a Christ follower, there's a, you're, we're, we're in a fight. Right, we talked about these two kingdoms. Our video on Sunday set that up so well, of showing kind of those two different parallel tracks. And so, there's a there's a right way to fight, and there's a wrong way to fight. So, what what would you say is that right way for us? Generally, we can get into specifics later. But how do we take what we know about the kingdom and help build it? It sounds. I mean, I mean that is an enormous question. It is both. (laughs) Sorry. No, it's both a. In some ways, it's both a posture and a practice. Great. And so. Part of it is how do you look at the culture in which God has sovereignly put you in? And that's where we kind of went toward the, you know, engage or embrace or emulate. Mm-hmm. And and there is a tension. And even in those three, there is a tension. You know, we use politics as an example. How invested in that do you, you know, uh, and that might be a little bit different for somebody else. I mean, I've got friends that are in politics and they're in Congress and stuff like that. Well, that's their calling. And that actually, this, you think about the word calling, or you think about the word vocation, we get our word calling from that. The medieval church actually was the time period where calling on a person's life only started to be, only only priests or only the formal religious leaders like me, we were the ones that were called. Well, that's right. not a biblical understanding of calling. Uh, it got that way for about 600 years, but that's not a biblical understanding. We are That kind of goes back to the whole priesthood of the believer. Right. Uh, my job is is pastoring and preaching like, like, you too as well. But our calling is not any more sacred. It's not any more sacred than the plumber. Mm. It's different, but it's not any more sacred. We're supposed to glorify God in what we do. I try to glorify him by God by leading church and preaching and so forth and so on. But the guy helping the, you know, building a house for a family to live in, he can glorify God. He can glorify God in exactly the way. You take the, the, the parable of the talents. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter if it's one, two, or five. All right, there's no, you don't compare. It's just what is your calling? And, and ultimately, it's how do we glorify God and what God's called you to do? Um, but it comes for the glory of God, the mission of God is kind of the two things. I want to, those are the two non negotiables. It's for the glory of God because you want to build his kingdom. And just like, like our buddy Joby said, he's like, God came on a rescue mission for us. Mm-hmm. And so then he sends us out as rescuers. So having a gospel lens as you go to work or as you go, take care of a baby, uh, whatever it is you do, you can glorify, you, you glorify God. You want to build his kingdom. I think that's what Jesus beautifully does in Matthew 28 because he takes the culture creating that you make a good product. It's a good product, period. Uh, he takes the Genesis 1, and then he takes Matthew 28 and says, uh, 
make disciples. Mm -hmm. So there's making disciples in those ways, and then there's creating culture, and you mm -hmm. can create culture and good things that lend good gifts to good people, and then you can um, also make disciples. He puts those things together, echoing that language in Matthew 28 to go out into all the world, yeah. and he puts them together. Yeah, and what we talk, we talk about share it and show it, yeah. or mm -hmm. declare and demonstrate, however you want to do it, as yeah. long as it's alliterated, it's legal. <laughs> uh, but but again, whether it's, you know you share it, the gospel has to be verbalized. But it's not either or; it's it's both and. Mm -hmm. um, churches tend to be better at one than the other. It kind of you know kind of depends on what they come up with, and and it's not really a balance as much as it is a co they complement each other. Right, they yeah. work together. Yeah. I think I'm I'm excited about the series because I've already seen like the way that in the New Testament the kingdom extends through people. So either in your job or whatever, it goes from the human heart conversion and extends to mm -hmm. not just your biological family, your church family, not just your church family, your work family. It, it goes to different areas, and that's mm -hmm. how the kingdom of God actually does. What does it look like it actually does spread through from the human heart to the ends sure. of the earth? Yeah. I mean, it is amazing. He, he tell, We're the ones that get to spread it. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. thinking that's, that's always mind-blowing. I mean, if God wanted to, I mean, he could have... He didn't have to... He didn't have to use Adam and Eve to make babies. He could have right. just made another Adam, yeah, just from the dust if he wanted to. And uh, you talk about good and bad. A quick little. This is a little bit of a caricature, but everybody's seen the bad form of, you know, of this where all you do you share but you don't show. So mm -hmm. everybody's seen the, the the plumber or somebody that's got the ichthus on the back of his car and Jesus saves and et cetera, and he does scubilon for work. I mean, he's like a he has terrible work ethic. It doesn't right. show up when he wants to do. Your pipe breaks a month later. That that is dishonoring to the Lord, right? Uh, um, and on you know on the flip side, sometimes you know some you know, somebody. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. An example, just somebody who shows great compassion and love and care, even though you might differ. We've seen tons of people come to Christ initially just by, you know, initially, you know, I, I actually give a rip about you mm -hmm. and maybe ask a question, and then anyway. So that's yeah, that's kind good. of the good and bad. Yeah, yeah. I, you reminded me there what you were talking about with working. In God's sovereignty, uh, I'm reading through Colossians personally, and like every sentence, I'm like, "Oh, kingdom of God, here it is!" You know, it's yeah. so thematically right there. But um, very, very uh, well-known verse here, which is, "Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men." Right. So that mm -hmm. idea of if you are a plumber, if you are a stay-at-home mom, if you are a CEO, if you are a pastor, doing that not for the sake, even first of others or even of your definitely of yourself but even of others but working unto the lord yeah. going back to the idea of giving him glory um rather than you know whatever else you're trying to build trying to build something sure. as a as a co-creator i think is the language you were talking about tyler earlier yeah yeah i mean paul uses in philippians 3 he uses a political word about commonwealth and we're citizens mm -hmm. right and talking about i think sunday we mentioned like identity and activity so if you go back to identity talking about the kingdom I'm really thankful for not just our, like in our worship gatherings, I mean, baptism. It's a kingdom imagery, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, Lord's Supper, communion. That's a, a witness to a new kingdom that we're practicing together. And so if you live out of your vision for what you think the kingdom is, this is what we're doing. Prayer, Advent blocks, whatever activity is coming from some of those things. They're, they're, some people can use tradition. That's a word. Right. You can use a tradition. You can it creates meaning in an image of what we think the kingdom of God is looking like. There's new creation mm -hmm. available when you see someone rise out of the waters of baptism. You see it at, at our gatherings and it goes from ideas on a page. We're talking about kingdom stuff. It goes from ideas on a page into our bodies on a Sunday and throughout the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, oh, man, it's this beautiful uh, responsibility. Maybe it's a good way to phrase that of what, God has allowed us and asked of us as members of the kingdom. One thing that I wanted to, as we kind of start uh, wrapping up our conversation today, one thing I wanted to explore a little bit further with you, Pastor, is uh, you mentioned essentially, hey, you can't change. Like uh, Part of what we do as a kingdom is we're trying to change um, our world to look more like the kingdom of heaven, right? We want uh, to, by making disciples, doing all these things. And so, but you can't change what you hide from. I think is the way you phrased it. And I want to explore this idea of how we often, especially the longer we've been following Jesus, maybe if that's a fair assessment, that mm -hmm. often we have this tendency to retreat from or to push away what it is that God's asked us to change. 
Uh, and I just wanted to get if see if you you know I'm sure like anything with prep you you say that statement and there's there's ten hours of something behind it. Um, but I wanted to ask if you had any thoughts for people on how do we how do we not hide from the thing we're trying to change? I know we've talked about that a little bit this morning, but right and the, you know we talked about you know do you engage. Uh, do you just act just like them, or do you escape? And, and right. again, it's not there's not matters of wisdom that you don't want to say. Listen, I can't be a part of this, and it's a lot of I can't be a part of this either because it'll either a personally I can't handle that uh, without doing dumb stuff. Uh, right. So you know, a lot of these are going to come into areas of of wisdom, all right? Just areas of wisdom. But I'd say when we use the words like fight, you know, the the weapons that God gives His people have to be different than, and they are different than the tactics of the world. Mm. So fight, I think primarily you're fighting, number one, I think if you look at Ephesians 6, you have to remember there's a system behind these people. So in other words, instead of characterizing the people who don't vote like you, look like you, think like you, um, and some of us just acting, you know, asking, okay, what's godly and also what's wise? For me, you know, some easy challenges. Do I spend more time, you know, trying to show people up on Twitter and how dumb their argument is or how wicked they are. I'm not saying there's not wickedness. I'm not saying those people right. aren't wicked. But, you know, if if I use, do I pray half as much for that person mm. as I do argue with them on Twitter? Those are just like personal examples. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, most of the, you know, I would say if they are, they're praying a lot. Uh, if you just based on the Twitter feeds, it's like, all right, that's, and that would be a challenge for me. I mean, there's stuff even yesterday. I was like, I wanted to get on there and go, this, you know, it's mm-hmm. so, so dumb. Blah, blah, blah. Like, you know what? The bandwidth. What are you going to spend on that? But I think you got, you got the word, you got prayer, and you have unity of mission. I think coming out of Ephesians from Ephesians four, five, and then obviously in six and those things. But um, when we draw, when we draw from the culture, you, first of all, you can't hide culture. Is just a widely held set of beliefs and values. Mm-hmm. And then from that culture, what you've got is if you want to if you want to think in the spiritual warfare realm, you've got a puppeteer behind there pulling the strings of some of that. Right. And will those people ever know it or not? Or they think you're wacky if you mention about a, you know, a personal devil or something like that. Right. It doesn't really matter. You, if you're a Christ follower, you can easily see how Jesus believed in a real devil. Oh yeah, you certainly can. And um, so I would say engage means be a part of your community. And again, as I mentioned yesterday, whether it be the PTA or the Little League. You, you're in there. It's very hard if you're if you're sitting at home and you have your own sports leagues where your kids you're never around those parents. Uh, and, and these are matters of wisdom. So you got to pick, you know, for your family. I'm just saying, if you, it's very hard to affect people that you have no impact with right. at all. Right. I'm not saying you got to build a relationship for five years before sharing the gospel. Right. I'm just saying that if you are not in your cult, if, and there's nothing inherently wicked about. Little League Baseball. I mean, it's not like that's the Pharisee attitude. Yeah. And that's what was, because I didn't grow up in church, but so I saw this first. Yeah. I saw that first. I saw the way it affected like my mom. My mom, you know, people use it as an excuse sometimes. It's like, well, because I pick out somebody at first Baptist, such and such, that's why I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that stained me because yeah. you had, you know, it stained me because you've got religious people who feel like, um, if I get close to that person, that sin's going to rub off on yep. me. Yep. And that's that is very much of a separatist attitude. Now, there's parts you got to separate. You're not going to mm-hmm. jump in there, and that's where the whole thing is. You know, the the Sadducees they just they lost their prophetic voice because they basically took out the stuff that would offend culture. But the Pharisees made the other deal. You know, they separated themselves, and kind of that's where the pride and that's where all that stuff comes in. And I was even you know I was just listening. I was listening to uh, Ephesians this morning on uh, who was it that sing, it's on the. I wasn't instead of reading, I was in my car and I just pushed it. It's yeah. What's the Getty lady that has an Australian accent? Oh, I don't know. Whatever. She I know read. What a, talking about? She yeah. read Ephesians to me this morning. Yeah. And it was just. It was talking about Paul's humility still. Yeah. And not just in Timothy, where he's like, "I'm the foremost of sinners," but he's also looking back in Ephesians. He's just. He's just. He's the sense of humility of the grace that God has shown him helped him. He was still super bold. Mm. He just looked at a at a person. He he looked at a person and thought totally. He, not as the enemy. Yeah. It's more of like that's the mission field. And I was there. Yeah, and uh, and you don't you don't have to be a you don't have to be soft. I mean, you don't have to be soft at all and you don't have to, and we're going to deal with biblical stuff very strongly. But if you read the Bible carefully, this culture, generally speaking, we're not going to usher in Christendom. Yeah. All right, it's not up to us to do the millennial kingdom. Uh, and the kingdom is going to come one heart at a time. 
as you and I share the gospel. And I understand those guys. I've been in those meetings where the preachers are like, well, I'm trying to hold back darkness to give us more time to share the gospel. And I'm like, to me, that kind of seems like weak because like bottom line is it's not effective, number yeah. one. And number two is who are you to think that you're going to hold back God's right. prophetic timeline to give you more time? Anyway. And we're out here to take ground, man. That's that's what he's called yeah. us to do. And not in the way that the world does, but to yeah. still. Uh, yeah. to, uh, take ground for sure, be involved, all that kind of stuff for sure. So that's, again, there's matters of wisdom there that we'll be talking about. But the as we image God, oh, again, you look at the early church, they were distinctively different. I remember this old Bill Bright thing he said in Kansas City way back in 1983, holiness is being distinctively different. And so that's what we're going to look at. The early church was that. They certainly shared the gospel, the way they treated outcasts, the way they treated the leftover people that people had kicked mm -hmm. out. Uh, God used that both the sharing and the showing. And, you know, 250 years later, you had millions of believers. Oh, yeah. To uh, put it really strongly, and I, I would imagine you guys would agree with me. Tell me if you don't. Um, as a pastor, I am... I have to work really hard to be around people who are not followers of Jesus. Um, and part of that is by design that we're to equip the saints, but part of it is just we're not always on the front lines um, versus my wife, who is, who's a high school public school teacher, high school English teacher, between teachers and administration and students. She has this like vast and amazing mission field that's like mm -hmm. right in front of her. For and so, sure. Um, again, we, that's not letting us off the hook. We still, all three of us have this um, command to make disciples and, and to reach those far from God. But if you're like listening, you're watching and you're hearing us talk about some of these things, like in some ways God has commissioned you for a closer face-to-face -face ministry with people to do some of the things we're talking about than even that, that we have sitting around this table. Um, and that's a responsibility that is amazing, which is, it goes right back to that. There's no divide between what is, I think you said sacred and secular, kind of a tongue twister, but it is alliterated, like you said. So, um, yeah, this, I mean, w again, this is going to be such a great theme to explore over the next several weeks. Make sure I didn't leave out any closing thoughts before we wrap up today, because we talked about a lot. No notes. No notes. No notes. That's a good place to be. All right. Hey, uh, for everyone watching and listening, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time, whether you're driving to work, whether you're doing chores at home, whether you're sitting in front of the TV watching our lovely faces uh, talk eloquently for a few minutes. I don't know who we were talking about. It wasn't the three of us. But, hey, thank you so much for uh, joining in and jumping in today. And uh, I'm hoping that this is going to be encouragement to you, encouragement to our church. That's why we're doing it. We want to help you grow as a disciple. And so before we wrap up, uh, one quick reminder, we're going to be continuing to talk about these things, and we want to hear from you. Some of the things that we're able to talk about are informed based on things that you would you feel like you don't know or you'd like to be equipped further in. And so uh, email us questions, thoughts, uh, podcast at builtmorechurch.com is the place to email that. And we're going to be discussing a lot of those along the way. It's been awesome to see some of those already over the last several weeks when we did it in 2022. And we're still going as we continue this year of worship. Another thing we're going to be talking about on here a lot. We got a lot going on. It's going to be a fun year. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you guys for jumping on today. Uh, so hope this is encouragement to you. As always, you are loved and sent.